We all have the ability to compartmentalize and it's a very effective part of our brain that takes over as like a defense mechanism to put certain things in a compartment in the mind so that you can go on with normal life and do what you need to do. It's not always a conscious choice to compartmentalize, right? Like if you're in survival mode or you're in crisis, you know, you can only deal with what's in front of you. Alicia K back again on the Soul Seeker podcast. I've personally slowed down the pod, but I think this is your second appearance, possibly third. I know we've done some other stuff together in collaboration. So thank you again for being back on the Soul Seeker show. Today's topic is all about compartmentalization, which if you're listening, I think that's five or six syllables. It's a big word, compartmentalization. You know, we kind of just say it so quick. Sometimes I slur my words. And for me, I'm one of those people who needs to see how a word is spelled to say it. You know, when I first got into podcasting about six years ago, I really wanted to say the word cognizant. And you and I were talking before we said this, like, is it a Z or not with compartmentalization and cognizant? You know, I think a lot of people get that wrong. And I really had to see how it was spelled and be like, oh, okay, now I feel a little bit more confident saying it. So that's neither here nor there. Long little intro, but Alicia K is a trauma-informed therapist. She is a somatic breathwork facilitator, a friend, a mother, a so many different things, a coach, and just an incredible human being that is a therapist, like I mentioned, that works with trauma, internal family systems included, and so many other things. And our focus for today is going to be centered around compartmentalization, but we're also going to veer as we do. So with that, Alicia, welcome back to the show. Yes. Thank you, Sam. What an incredible introduction. It's great to be here again, you know, just to chat and really dig deep into this topic and share my expertise from what I see in my practice. But also what you know about me is I'll probably share some personal stuff and throw myself under the bus a little bit too. Throw yourself under the bus. <laughs> We'll just go there. Self-talk. Okay. So we'll, we'll start here and we're, we're going to keep the anchor of compartmentalization, but we're also going to follow the threads. So what's your feeling on self-talk? Because I, I'm like really keen on trying to address that with myself and letting friends call me out and then me working with my clients. Like it just something like throw myself under the bus. Like that's not bad self-talk, is it? No. And it's interesting because, you know, in the therapy world, it's actually really deterred for the therapist to share personal information about themselves because there's sort of like this hierarchical relationship, which truly, like, I've never really been one to follow the rules. And I've never felt that that was necessary because when you can share something with the person sitting across from you, like from a personal experience, it, it's very real and it's a very felt sense around that only do I know what you're going through. But this is how I handled it. And if that's helpful for you, awesome. But let's teach you how to do it in your own way, right? We are equal, right? I am no better than you and you're no better than me. Like we're in this together in this relationship. And so the more I'm able to share about some of those struggles, then the more the person like can relate to me as a human, as a felt sense of, oh, she gets it. She's not judging me because, you know, she worked through it herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And it it's funny, the synchronicity there, because I've been thinking a lot about that recently, the difference between like a therapist and a coach. Because with me, I recently brought on at the time of this recording a new one, one client. And I was realizing like, I don't think they like it if I say something about myself or I don't know if they're interested at all. Whereas, whereas with most of my coaching clients, like they ask me, like they want to know more in my life. They want me to share. And I'm like, I think this other client's kind of used to more therapy. And I was like, and so I've been thinking about that the past couple of days. So thanks for addressing that. And I do feel like there's somewhat of a different energetic exchange between like a therapist versus a coach. And you are both. So, yeah. yeah, and I agree as well. Like, you know, beat to the, beat to the drum, another expression. What is the expression there? Beat Dance to the drum. Beat your own drum. That'll work. Yeah. That's probably what I was looking for. 
So compartmentalization, can you just give us an overview so we all have kind of like a broad understanding from a ther- therapist's point of view of what it means? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, there's been kind of a negative connotation around this word or this term for, you know, quite some time, right? But the truth is, is that we all have the ability to compartmentalize and it's a very effective part of our brain that takes over as like a defense mechanism to put certain things in a compartment in the mind so that you can go on with normal life and do what you need to do, right? And obviously, when you get home from work, you don't want to carry your work with you into your home space, right? So you put work in the day in a compartment, and then you get to be with your family, you get to be home, and you get to detach and unwind. And so it's a very healthy thing to do, and it's what the brain does for you naturally. But where it gets a little bit complicated is when the things that go in the compartment are no longer brought up or acknowledged or what is it? It's not forgetting, but it's it's denied, right? So the higher the degree, the trauma from childhood or undigested, unprocessed emotion, the higher the degree of compartmentalization or dissociation, you know? So it really is a defense mechanism, a coping skill to be able to live life appear normal, do the daily tasks that you need to do. But it gets, again, complicated when someone isn't really willing to acknowledge that old stuff or the brain isn't giving you the information for you to be able to process that stuff because it's put it in an emotional holding tank that you don't have access to. So it really is the brain's way to process and store information by putting it into either storage boxes in the mind or like files. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another synchronicity, because it just clicked for me like a couple days ago with the brain being a supercomputer. And I was like, oh my God, like I can't imagine, or I, I, how many times in my life I've been like, oh, I can't access that file in my brain. And I was like, oh yeah, I've, I've on subconsciously, consciously, I'm not sure which that would be subconsciously. Yeah. It referred to my brain as a supercomputer, the ultimate supercomputer without me like quote unquote, knowing it. And that that totally resonates. And what's interesting with how you describe compartmentalization is I think the intent for a lot of people is to come back to that, whether it's trauma, work, whatever it is, most, mostly trauma, right? You know, it's like, okay, let me put that in a file. Let me put that in a folder. Let me put that in a box. I need to be in survival now. And it's almost like what, what's coming up for me is like when we want to do something and we keep putting it off, right? And we never actually use that archetypal energy of yang masculine to be like, okay, now I'm going to be committed and disciplined to look into this thing. So w- what is that fine line? What, what do you recommend for people on how to approach compartmentalization from a more healthy way? Yeah, well, the one thing to understand is that it's not always a conscious choice to compartmentalize, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you're in survival mode or you're in crisis, you know, you can only deal with what's in front of you, right? You can't deal with the effects that it has and everything around you or how it's impacting your life. Like you're just trying to get through the day. And so oftentimes the feelings, the events and and the, the circumstances will get stored in the brain, you know, in that filing tank or in that filing system, right? And Eventually, what we know about the body, what we know about, you know, the human psyche is that it will come back up to resurface. And those Mm. things often look like triggers, right? So the triggers become the unprocessed stuff that's in that compartment or that part of your brain, which is our hippocampus, which is our holding tank for our emotional trauma, unmet needs, you know, really like these big scars that the brain will sort of break up into fragments of information that can later be digested little by little by little that will keep cycling back for us to look at. So it is best to do the work to clear it out quicker. But if you're in, let's just say, an abusive relationship for three years, there's so much there that you almost, the brain can't, it doesn't have the capacity to hold on to all of those details and all of that over time, right? So what you'll often see is someone will only hold on to the bad or only hold on to the good, and then all the bad stuff will get put back in the compartment because it's too much to face, right? That's Mm. that's how people can sustain, 
you know, unhealthy relationship dynamics like that. So like false positivity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, I feel helpless. I can't get out of this right now. And so, you know, thinking about the bad all the time isn't going to keep me alive. It's not going to keep me surviving. Mm -hmm. Right. Like maybe I don't have the capacity to leave or the means to leave, or maybe he's holding my children over my head or, you know, whatever. We don't need to get in like the violent relationships to trigger people, but that's generally what happens. And then what we find is when the brain or the body, the human being is in a safe enough place or a safe enough environment, the things that the brain put back in that storage tank will start to come through mm. as a way for them to work through it because we are always trying to work towards safety psychologically, emotionally, and physically. And then you'll notice people will start to say like, why is this coming up now? You know, I thought I was over that. It's, you know, I'm out of it. Time has passed. And, you know, we have to really process through, you know, those triggers, those painful events, because as you know, being a somatic breathwork practitioner, all of that stays stored in our nervous system. Right. hundred percent. So bringing a bit of spirituality into this, it's almost like soul contracts and karma. If I'm hearing you correctly, where now like there's this person, the situation, whatever it may be, where it is. This is a safe environment to now revisit what has been compartmentalized. And now is the opportunity to heal that wound. And a trigger comes up because it's what you're experiencing. Then at that point, it's how are you going to handle that trigger? Am I hearing you right? Yes, because the psyche will arrange relationships to, to help you clear out or repeat what's not resolved in you. You know, so that's where that trigger, those triggers come from. And if you choose not to address, you know, the wound or the, you know, what happened to you essentially, then, you, you know, you'll essentially keep attracting those karmic relationships and patterns because, you know, your soul doesn't want you to hold on to that anymore. Right? It wants you to evolve and overcome that. You know, maybe that's setting boundaries for yourself. Maybe that's putting yourself first in relationships instead of putting somebody else above you. You know, whatever it is, it's always that journey back to self and doing that deeper work. Okay. Your question? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm taking it all in because I think for a moment there, my my brain, <laughs> my mind started to drift and go into a different scenario. And then I was like checking out for a moment. I was like okay, pulling myself back in. You know, I always joke with the dance of podcasting because, you know, it's like, so hard sometimes with active listening being like present and also like continuing to guide the conversation but where where i'm wanting to go with this is basically in the moment of that trigger and i i imagine you're gonna say some of the things that i would say as well but there's probably some things that are new and different and especially for listeners and also just repetition as well the more we hear these things when that trigger comes up like Obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, you're quote unquote doing the work. And that's another thing we could talk about is shadow work. But uh, for someone that's doing the work and they're learning about these healing modalities and practices and tools and whatever you want, call it like the real mastery is in the heat of the moment to be able to draw on that specific tool in your tool belt. So like, how do you recommend for people to process their triggers when they're coming up? Well, I don't want to get on my soapbox too much about how we live in. Oh, please do. It's not Go on that soapbox. This is this is your title, right. show. Let's do we it. We live in a damn freaking world where people don't want to feel their feelings, right? They want to avoid it. They want to escape it. They want to numb it. They want to dodge it. They don't want to sit and feel it. You know, so a lot of my work with people is retraining them and working with the protector part in them that wants to avoid their emotional experience that doesn't want to be curious about it, that doesn't want to feel the intensity of it and let it flow through them, right? We're so trained that when we have something that's bubbling up emotionally in us, we'll talk ourselves out of it, right? You know, that emotion is meant to come up. It's meant to come out. And the more you suppress that, the more you deny that, the more that pattern's just going to keep repeating, right? Because mm -hmm. we are, we essentially are sensory beings. We need to feel in order to heal. So the first one is to recognize that you're feeling something, right? Label it. 
instead of trying to figure out what made me feel this way, oh, well, he said this and he said this or she did this and my boss did this. And like you get into the mental, you know, jumbo, like ruminating thoughts or over obsessive thoughts about what happened. The Rubik's Cube, as Candice, our, our mutual teacher, would say. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Rub so Rubik's Cube. So it's like, wait a minute. I notice them all in my head. What am I really feeling right now? Right. Like what I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling a lot of grief. I'm feeling really angry, right? Label the emotion. And then, then you can say, all right, well, what story am I attaching to this emotion? Right? What am I telling myself about this? What am I imagining? What story am I creating in my mind? And then be between the feeling that you're having and the negative belief that you're having, you can float it back to an earlier time in your life, perhaps when you were a child or adolescent, and you had similar thoughts and similar feelings that were stored in the body. And that's why it's bubbling up so intensely in the moment, right? Now. Right. So nine times out of 10, what you're facing in present moment, I always use a zero to 10 scale. How intense did the emotion feel in a scale of zero to 10? Zero is I'm completely neutral. I'm fine. 10 is the highest it can be. Anything above a six means that it's old stuff that's being triggered in you. Mm. Interesting. So then it's like, all right, well, I'm probably at like a 10 right now. So that, that's definitely some old crap. Where in my life have I felt this way? What am I telling myself? What does this remind me of? Or who does this remind me of? Because you're always trying to get back into homeostasis and imbalance. And the way that the brain works is it forms memory networks or themes, right? So that memory network of, let's just say, you know, everyone that loves me always leaves me. Or, you know, I'm always being abandoned. Well, that didn't happen as a 42-year-old adult woman right? The only reason I have a wound about that is because my dad left me in childhood and I was told the story that he didn't want me, mm -hmm. right? You know, so yeah. it's always a journey back of what's going on in the present moment and then cycling it back and letting yourself really feel and process through that. Journaling is a great tool. You know, let's, let's, let's write it out because the minute that you start to, you know, purge on paper, whatever thought you have in your head, then you'll see your higher self start to come in or a voice behind your voice in your head where you're getting more channeled conscious information around how to handle the situation and how to feel about it. 100%. And with the journaling, just a uh, stream of consciousness or any specific prompt, stream of consciousness? If, yeah. I mean, I often hear a lot of people who are pretty resistant to facing their feelings. They don't want to do that. So sometimes I'll give them a theme you know, write a letter to the person that just hurt you. You know, if you get, if you get a topic, right? If I am feeling really anxious right now, well, what are some other feelings that go along with anxiety? Are you scared? Do you feel helpless? Do you feel powerless? Do you feel hopeless? You know, what are some other emotions? And what is my relationship to that emotion? Mm -hmm. Write about that. You know, what, what have I been taught about feeling my feelings? You know, what happened to you that made you block our innate ability to process through this stuff. Generally, there's a lot of wounding there from childhood around. You know, I wasn't able to express myself emotionally. I, and then there's like shame around it, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't want you to feel shame. So then protector parts come in to block that, block any emotion, any sensation, because we label that as wrong or bad or, or feeling of rejection. Absolutely. And the protectors are the internal family systems, parts work type stuff, guys. So in the show notes, if you're not familiar with the IFS, definitely connect with Alicia so you can learn more. I have a blog on internal family systems, IFS parts work, and the first podcast or previous one we did with Alicia's link there as well. So you can do a deep dive there. So much to explore with internal family systems. You know, this is just another big synchronicity because I had uh, my group call before this earlier today. And one of the people in the call mentioned something about how they were talking about work situation. Oh, I can feel the stress and overwhelm right now, but I, I'm just not going, you know, whatever. I'm going to brush it off. And then they kept talking, 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 whatever. All good. And then I was like, hey, can we go back to that part where you mentioned that you felt the stress? And person's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, cool. Can you feel that now? They're like, yeah. I go, okay, can you close your eyes and can you breathe into that and feel it in your body and accept it? And what's so fascinating 
is that science teaches us that there's a 90 second physiological response that happens within the body when we feel an emotion. And if you're hearing this for the first time, that's totally cool. But emotions are energy in motion. So when we compartmentalize, like in this situation of when you might be feeling something heavy in a work situation, when it's not about work and you want to be present with the other person, you're like, I'm not going to focus it on it now. You're essentially compartmentalizing, right? Yeah. So in this situation, it's like, well, instead of compartmentalizing it and putting it in that box, can we slow down? Can we soften? Can we feel that? Can we, what may seem counterintuitive to actually accept that, but affirm that stress in our body and then let it breathe through us. And this person, I walked them through this and afterwards they reported back that, oh my God, that I can't believe that made such a big shift. So bringing this kind of full circle, I think it's really important. You know, one thing I've been working on recently is mindful eating and I've noticed just in working with a couple of my clients that have this as one of their things they're working on, like how I will kind of use food and subconsciously just my body takes me to the fridge or the cabinet and then I shove my face with some food and it keeps me from feeling what I'm feeling and just bring more intentionality around that. It's amazing the shifts and how I'm slowing down and all the things. But uh, where I was going with this was back to the compartmentalization in the moment. This is the tricky part that why I reached out to you and was I like, hey, I want to have a conversation about compartmentalization on the podcast because it seems to me like I get what you're saying in terms of that being good to compartmentalize a work thing or whatever, but it, there's not really like a a, a right or wrong way. It's very subjective almost because for me, it feels better to not put it in a box and just be like, wait, if something's coming up, why don't we address this now? Whether it's with someone else or, or myself. I mean, I, and this is my rant here. I remember after my first time doing ayahuasca four years ago, being like, I am done with surface level conversations. Like I do not want this stuff. So I think a lot of the reasons why we compartmentalize is because it's like, wait, it's not socially acceptable in this moment for me, but wait, 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 I need to talk about my feelings. I need a second here to talk about this and to process this and to slow down. So with all that just being on the table, curious to hear what comes up for you. Yeah, what you're describing to me is a lot of what I like to look at as far as people who are, you know, quote unquote, in an unawakened state or in a in a sleep state where they don't know their divinity, they're not connected to source or spirit or God or whatever language you want to put around that, you know, to people like you and I who are really into evolution and evolving as a human being and as a soul, right? So oftentimes we will in our life be in relationship with people who are quote unquote not awake and who have a really high degree of compartmentalization because they don't want to acknowledge their stuff. Right. right. And that can often trigger us because, you know, we are so introspective and working with people who do not want to be introspective can cause a lot of conflict. Right. So if someone, you know, is essentially, you know, in an unawakened state and they're not necessarily on that path yet or chose not to be in this lifetime, we don't ever really know. It can be really difficult because what you'll find is that other person lives in like a perpetual state of denial or they constantly pretend that things didn't happen because they operate in a very logical, almost transactional, superficial way so that they don't have to access deeper levels of emotion or trauma, right? It's their coping mechanism that their brain chose to get them through what they went through. And so we often find what you're saying is, I don't want to have superficial conversations anymore. I just am not welcoming that in my life, right? But what do you do when that's a family member or like a mother or a father or, the ch or like the parent of your child? Right. When when someone can't meet you at that level, you know, it's really important for us to to be able to recognize that, to not try to change that person, to not try to get them to see it our way, to not call them out on the fact that they're in denial or whatever, because then that just causes a lot of violent conversation. It's us as evolved beings 
that need to do our work to rise above that and really work on accepting where people are at in their spiritual infancy, I would call it, and their choice to remain in, in that way. But then we can set boundaries around, like you're saying, what we choose to interact with and what we want and what we don't. Yeah, love it. Love it. That, yeah, I totally agree. And embodiment and all the things and it kind of comes. It, this is the part that I struggle with with embodiment when we say like patience with the relationships. And this is things I say all the time, right? And you have to embody it first. It's like, well, what about the quantum physics side of this? Because I believe in quantum physics. So what in me is manifesting and bringing up this mirror? And then it's like, okay, the deeper you go down there, then and you're able to start seeing that piece of you within that other person. And then when you slow down, you start doing the inner work and then you start getting your inner landscape in order. It, it's like almost trippy because you're not on psychedelics or anything like that. But you're like, how did I just shift time lapse? Like, the, how is this person all of a sudden real chill? And then it, it can go back and forth. And then, you know, just throwing a lot out here on the table. But, you know, there's also the belief of every night we go to bed. You know, we have the opportunity to enter into a new timeline when we wake up. So I don't know. It can really get someone confused as <laughs> the deeper you go with that stuff. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I'm 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 a constant person that's always working on myself, you know, but the difference between me and my awakened state versus me and my asleep state was in my asleep state. Yeah, I would still do my personal reflection. But I would constantly look at that external person as someone I was trying to change or someone I was trying to get them to see it my way or to understand me or, you know, I, or I would like fight, you know, to try to get my point across or like there was all this like really awful exchange of energy. And eventually I learned like, wait a minute, the work is never about that other person. If I shift and change my internal state, you know, the law of nature says that that automatically has to shift as well, right? That person can never change a day in their life. But if you change your internal experience and what you're expecting and what you're saying and how you're feeling about you, then you don't have to project onto that other person. That was really good, Alicia. Can you say that again what you're saying? What were those few things? Which part? Uh, you just said what you're saying about yourself. And there was like a few things. Anyways, you guys I'll can be changing my one. internal state, right? That's the quantum physics. If yeah. I move myself energetically to work on what this person is teaching me, what they're showing me, you know, what my inner work is, that person never has to change a day in their life. But because I do, my energy changes, my energy shifts. I try to be more loving. I try to be more accepting. I try to be more boundaried. I try to be more forgiving. The law of nature says anything out in nature has an equal and opposite reaction. So that person also has to have that as well without doing any of their inner work. Right? Fire. Fire. I change me so everything around me starts to organically shift to match my energy. I, I love that. And I, I just invite you guys to hit pause and you know, re-listen to that like three times, like before you go to bed and when you wake up and just get that planted in your subconscious mind while in your brain's in theta state. So you rewire those neuro pathways in the brain. Because what's so fascinating is I was rec I, I've been doing a deep dive of quantum physics and subconscious limiting beliefs and all the things. And I've talked about contemplation and reflection mainly because I heard Adyashanti, I saw Adyashanti speak a few years ago and he just blew my mind and he was talking about the lost start of porch gazing or like you're just sitting there and there's nothing there. It's basically contemplation and it resonated with me so much. So I've talked about contemplation and reflection as a practice in addition or placement of meditation for years now. But I, it wasn't until recently that I learned that the brain actually is firing and wiring differently when you contemplate and when you reflect, you're actually building new neuro pathways, which create new neuro networks, which is how to use Dr. Joe's language, Dr. Joe Dispenza, 
you would break the habit of being your old self to build your new self and your new reality, your new personal reality, your personality. And what's so fascinating, why I'm bringing this up is in this situation that you're talking about in experiencing a trigger with someone else. And we say this all the time, right? Like we feel like we just want to shake them to awaken them and we think we know what's best. But that's a human fixer pandemic where it's like, wait a second, let me go back to myself to see what's going on here. Now you have to make the time because when you're in that moment, you're in that moment. That's not the time to do it right then. You got to come back to it later on, bringing this back to compartmentalization and like the follow through, the yin and the yang, like tapping into that yang energy and having the discipline to sit in the contemplation. And that is the opportunity to do the inner work. So kind of bring it all together, you know? Yeah, that's, that's, you know, very well said. Because the truth is, is that when we're in a triggered state, we're actually in our downstairs brain or our survival brain, our reptilian brain, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're in your reptilian brain, you don't have access to the upstairs brain, which is your higher level learning of cognition, rational, like peaceful, like logic, right? So the two parts of the brain essentially are split off. So the only thing to get you out of that survival part of your brain, which is where you want to fight, right? You want to run away. You want to hide. You want to like ditch the person. You want to leave or you freeze and you do nothing and you submit, right? So your brain essentially is not online. You're not in a place to make decisions in that state. So only time gets you out of that. And that's when you can go back, when you're feeling more grounded, when enough time has passed or you get enough separation from the situation to go back and say, hey, what was really going on there? And what's being communicated with me? Because it's never really about the other person. It may be a boundary that you need to set with the other person. You know, it may be something that you need to, to say or to set or to expect, but it's always a journey back to self. And so, yes, yeah. contemplating on, you know, what was going on in my body, what piece of that argument or that situation or that hurt stands out to me the most? You know, okay. where have I felt this before? Where, who does this person remind me of? Right. We often attract, you know, you know, the wounded person that represents mother or father wounds that are unresolved in us psychologically. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Does that differ depending on the gender you identify with, if it would be one or the other? No. No. I mean, through my spiritual evolution, I've attracted people who trigger my mother wound and I've attracted people who trigger my father wound. And I've played both sides where I've been the quote unquote, like abuser or the person that didn't give a crap or I was the runner. And I've also been the person that, you know, sort of was like the chaser in a relationship of like, you know, so knowing your wounds and knowing what they feel like in your body can be really important for people because then it's like, oh, what is what is coming up in the in me? What does this remind me of? Who does this feel like? So if it, if you're okay with going there, otherwise it's it's cool too. But what was it for you that helped you to get to a point of transformation in overcoming those? I, I think you said runner, and it was something else for the other one. Like what was that that catalyst? Because most of the time, like. You, you know, it, it usually has to be something big it, it, or this is their esoteric side. Did someone else, <laughs> you know, do their quantum physics to get you to be that way, which I don't think that's really the answer, but that's an interesting rabbit hole go down. You know, it, it took, it, it took a long journey, um, uh, you know, I would say in society's terms, failed relationships or situations for me to realize that the reason I keep attracting these types of individuals or these familiar energetics is because I didn't know my own worth and I didn't know my own value, right? So when you really start to reflect on the ways that you, or for me personally, I don't want to put it out there, but my journey was I had a huge unworthiness wound and I had a huge you know, being unwanted wound or abandonment wound, we would call that. And I never felt like I was enough. And I was incredible. My emotions and me as a child 
felt like it was absolutely invisible. Like my mother was in a perpetual state of survival. She was a teenage mom. So was my dad. He didn't want children. I grew up in a complete survival state. And so I was the invisible child that just got pulled along for the ride. And so through that, it created a lot of wounding or stories in my mind around why these things happened to me. And throughout my adult life, I essentially attracted relationships or called in relationships to expose that in me so that I could really start to see the ways that I wasn't valuing myself because of my trauma. And when I started to do that inner work around, you know, I'm worthy because I am and my presence is enough. I worked with a lot of internal family systems around my protector parts, firefighters, and my exiled child parts, and got to a place in my life where it was like, my presence is enough, and I don't need to do anything to make anybody desire me. And I attract my compliment because that relationship is for me, not because I have more wounds to heal. Yeah, thank you. The worthiness piece speaks volumes. You know, this is something that I personally have been focused on the majority of this year. And that's been really my my journey these past few years, so much so that I have a new program coming out called Mastering Worthiness, which is all around this. And Yashanti's got a book. I don't know if you've heard, I always recommend listening to Yashanti just as an aside, if you can, because his voice is amazing. But this book is called Healing the Core Wound of Unworthiness. Have you ever? Oh, not no. my book idea. Not the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's yeah. it. You know, like yeah. that's I love. If I, can, if I could really summarize what I do in my program, it's to teach people about their own worthiness and mm-hmm. the ways that they're giving that up. Absolutely. Through their wounds. And my follow up to that is what about chasing? worthiness or chasing any of these things because it seems like in the healing journey which i do want to touch on shadow work after this but it seems like in doing this shadow work it's really oftentimes that we put something on a pedestal and we are kind of like making it bigger than it needs to be like, oh, I need to become worthy, you know, or I need to be abundant or I need to feel myself love, whatever your specific thing is in working through traumas. And it, it's a story and the story starts to just like get bigger and bigger and gets harder and more difficult. Well, what comes up there for you? Well, that's what puts first a person in an ego death, right? Because you can't, you can't constantly chase and chase and chase and chase and chase. And, you know, that addictions come in, right? Like, because you're always seeking something for validation. And when that's never enough, then you turn to, to deeper, deeper methods. And it does become this chasing mentality because you essentially are comfortable sitting with yourself in the present moment. Like that contemplation piece of like, how far have I come? You know, every single time this issue comes back around for me, What have I learned from it? What am I gaining from it? I'm always on an upward spiral, right? Which is very familiar in in our fit for service community around we're always on an upward trajectory. But if we're constantly chasing the next best thing, then we're never fully enjoying the present moment and feeling at peace with where we are. Mm -hmm. And the reason we can't do that is because we're constantly trying to survive this 3D, you know, grind culture matrix that teaches you that you are successful based on what you have and what you have to show versus who you are as a human being. Yeah, that re- that's my story. And, you know, the yogic philosophy of sadhana comes up, you know, which is really to be in the pursuit of, and it's the cliche saying of it's about the journey, not the destination. And that's why we see so many successful people reach the pinnacle of their success, almost like the movie Soul. And being like, oh, wow, I thought I'd feel different. And then that's where the inner journey comes in. We learn things about sadhana and all these other things. And the other piece of sadhana it, that's really been eye-opening and blew my mind in my yoga teacher training, Yos- Costa Rica, shout out to G- Dakota Shea of Elo Yoga. But he said, to name your ultimate potential is to limit your ultimate potential. 
So rather than say for me, you know, build this million dollar business while working four hours a day, which I achieved or being named Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list when I was just 31 years old as a guy selling swag, when I had other people I knew that just turned 40 and were doing amazing things, big things. One guy created Little Italy in downtown San Jose in Silicon Valley, like a big thing. And he didn't get the recognition, you know, and then there's my worthiness. Like, do I even deserve this? But I achieved this thing. Now I can't accept this thing. Oh, I thought I'd finally feel different. No, now I'm just adding more unworthiness, right? And where the ultimate potential, as opposed to naming this thing, this goal, you know, it's creating the habits and routines of fulfillment now. What What's going to make you feel fulfilled now? You, you know, are you into Bashar's work at all? I don't know. Who's that? He's his name's Daryl Anka, and he chair, channels Bashar. You'd be into into him. He's cool, but you know, just to break down his his formula, like he's got something he calls the formula, and it's literally to find follow your excuse me, follow your highest excitement. So the idea is, in any moment, we have an opportunity, we have choices. What is going to bring you the highest excitement? And, you know, I've really used that as my my North Star these past four years. I forget it from time to time. But when I remember following my highest excitement and just like the simple things too, like, you know, it could be related to food. Maybe I'm hungry, <laughs> you know, or working out like after this, you know, I haven't, I oh, I want to talk with you about movement too. So we'll transition to movement. You know, I haven't moved today. And I didn't really move yesterday. And I've gotten in a place now where I'm swimming or doing yoga every day. And I'm doing, when I'm doing yoga, most of the time it's hot yoga. So I'm drenched and it's really starting to click with me in terms of physical activity and diet. How like that's been such a missing piece in my own spiritual journey. So my, my question here for you is like, I think you're a competitive CrossFitter or you're just a CrossFitter, right? Uh, just a, cro a crossfitter. I I mean, just a crossfitter. Well, no, but I, you know, if you want to say competitive, I tried out for American Ninja Warrior a couple times. And so that- Yeah, was, you're competitive. That was my passion. I'm super competitive. I'm a warrior, like energetically, like I come from, you know, lots, lots of that energetic. And so I do have that spirit in me to be super ultimately competitive. So yeah, it's been a huge drive for me from Ninja to CrossFit to- you know, obstacle course races and, and all of those things. But I need to add at this next phase of my evolution, the balance of more yin energetic. Yeah, I'd say I'm the opposite. Yeah. Around, you know, doing more of that flowy, non sweaty exercise that I tend to resist. It, it's so interesting. And it's the awareness, you know, and I think that's it's amazing too how different people resonate with people differently. And, you know, we all have our little different nuances and things like that. But yeah, that's something that I haven't really brought into it much in terms of sweat. And I think it really has been like a game changer for me personally. So I, I, I appreciate hearing the that we're on opposite ends of the spectrum of what we're focusing on there. Okay. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it's so personal, you know, like, and, yeah. and I think that that's where it's, you know, know thyself. That's, that's the biggest gift, you know, and to bring it back to the compartmentalization piece, there's people out there that choose not to do that and that's okay. But as awakened beings, we have to choose how to work with that. Yeah. Yeah. And the compartmentalization and knowing thyself goes into the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is shadow work. I think, you know, we overcomplicate shadow work. I can't tell you how many times re recently I've heard someone say something about shadow work. And I'm just like, I'm at the point of rolling my eyes with it, being like, listen, the fact that you're on the path, what is on the path? I mean, you're on the path of willing to take off your mask and remove the layers of conditioning and programming and go into the depths of your psyche, that is shadow work. Let's not overcomplicate it. Yes, while we're on this path, we can veer from it. We can be like, oh, I have the opportunity to go drink with some friends or I could stay home and meditate. So now that I decide to, that I'm going to drink, that's lower vibrational and frequency. I'm not doing shadow work. You know, like if we could get lost like that and all this other stuff. But when you are doing conscious work on yourself and you're you're going deeper, like to me, that is shadow work. That it's that simple. I agree. You know, and there's tons of 
archetypes out there for shadow work, right? But I think the survival archetypes are what people miss the most of. It's like, you know, I'm, I've dabbled in it, but my psyche doesn't resonate that strongly with it. I'm more of an IFS person. But, you know, when it comes to like the child, the saboteur, the prostitute, you know, like those are important, sure, things to look at and the ways that you, you know, maybe are sacrificing yourself or you're giving yourself up or you're going into fantasy. But the key component of shadow work is that, you know, when you bring the unconscious into the conscious, it's no longer a shadow, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, am am I making this choice? Am I discerning what I need to do here from my conscious mind where I'm deliberate about what I'm doing and why I'm doing that? Or am I having an unconscious programmed reaction and falling back into, back to Joe Dispenza, like the unconscious program or the familiar self. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be willing to bring it up to look at it and be curious about why we do what we do and where that comes from in order to be able to interrupt the pattern and change the result. And it's so much more fun. You know, we we, we make this journey like so heavy and dense all the time, but like really like it's fun getting to know yourself and getting curious and be like, oh, and Yeah. So the takeaway for this pod and for those of you listening in terms of compartmentalization, it see, and I'm going to let you say, but it seems like to me, it's about awareness and it's always about awareness and spirituality. Right. But it's like, how am I being, am I compartmentalizing this thing to avoid it and not look at and put in a box that's going to go in the attic of my mind that I'm never going to go up into and open these old files. Or am I just saying, hey, not right now, but I'll make the time and space to come back to it? Exactly. And I also just want to add in for this last piece is if you are in a relationship with someone who is compartmentalizing and who isn't acknowledging what they're doing, yeah. then I would say it's it's time to make a different choice, right? Because you're never going to get somebody to acknowledge the thing that you want them to see if they're not ready to see it and they're not ready to do that work. You know, I have so many people in my practice, you know, who, who, let's just say, stay in a relationship with someone that cheats on them and like that person never comes and shows remorse or wants to do their inner work or like shifts the blame. You know, compartmentalization, if you want to throw out terms around there, can also look like narcissistic behavior or personality, right? And so it's that's the biggest compartmentalization piece of a personality. And it's really up to us to figure out why we're attracting this person, why we're accepting that, and to make a better choice to not allow it and walk away and choose self, right? So yes, do your work on what you're compartmentalizing, but also really be cognizant about the relationships that you're in where people are doing. 100%. You know, and what's coming up for me when I hear that is it there's been a lot of people that have been in my field. I think with the emergence of psychedelics and plant medicine for healing, you know, that I've heard these stories of like one of the partners in a relationship, essentially paraphrasing here being like, I'm not going to be in it anymore unless you go do ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there's even been stories of this I've heard where the person that said it hasn't even done that thing, say ayahuasca for that example. So I think it's important as well because that is something that doesn't really get talked about. Like, it, it, especially with plant medicines and psychedelics, the person's gonna need to feel called and come to it on their own terms. But even almost like just doing any form of shadow work, like if you want to get like your spouse, like, hey, I'm not going to be in this relationship anymore unless, like, if you're doing that, then you know, like, hey, it's just time for me to step away, right? Am I hearing you right? Yeah, I mean, that's control. That's not love. Yeah, yeah. Right? True. And, I mean, and and when we do that, when we try to control, we try to control the outcome to avoid our pain or to avoid whatever's coming. You know, essentially what, what we're doing is we're not trusting the divinity inside of the person that we're across from. They're on their own path. They're on their own journey. They have their own innate intelligence inside of them. Who are you to tell them how they should be living their life or what they should be doing? Right? Mm-hmm. We're not God. We're not source. We're not, we're not the universe. Like, you know, you guys are doing this dance, but I think it can become, you know, pretty unbalanced and controlling when you're trying to change somebody for your own really selfish needs. 
Yeah, I think this is a topic that needs to be addressed more because especially in the post pandemic and lockdown world, because so many more people are getting interested in all forms of healing, but there's not really the intentions aren't really met with education, if you will. But anyways, thank you so much, Alicia. A pleasure as always. Tell us about what you got going on. What's up your sleeve, what you're cooking on and what you have offering with your clients, all the things. Yeah. So right now I'm incredibly passionate about my six month program where I have combined so many modalities, you know, really in a six month container where we get to do internal family systems work. We get to do EMDR, eye movement therapy to resolve and clear out that trauma along with the body work and breath work. So you get 12 individual sessions with me with customized plan to work through what you're going through to heal what needs to be healed to really get that awareness of self so that you can feel empowered and embodied and worthy along with the six somatic breathwork sessions. And so it's very much a container of the mental and of the physical to really help get the mind, body, spirit back into alignment and balance and, and really get to a place of, you know, feeling more grounded in who you are as a person, but also how you want to feel every day. I love it. Yeah. You know, it's all about grounding and grounding. I always tell people like, I'm, I'm the same way, like, Hey, if you're looking like for channeling or like, you know, extra sensory stuff, I'm not your guy, you know, like, <laughs> like, you're looking for grounding and, you know, a more fulfilling life and to gain, to know yourself and just more joy and love and happiness. Awesome. Let's talk, let's do the work, but there's a place for it at all. You know what I mean? And we're all at different stages. So I think it's amazing. And thank you so much again for sharing your wisdom. Always a pleasure. And we'll see you on next time on the show. Yes. Awesome, fam. Thank you. My pleasure always. Thank you. Thank you.